Welcome everybody. I am Ari Engel. Thank you for joining us today. We have some really great uh, people joining us from all around the world and we have an amazing discussion today with two of the foremost authorities on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from both the Jewish and Arab communities in Israel. Feel free to leave questions in the Q&A section and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible uh, towards the later part of the discussion. Uh, to introduce our guests briefly, first we have Yossi Klein-Halevi. Yossi is a Jewish citizen of Israel and a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and a non-resident fellow of the Trends Think Tank in Abu Dhabi. He co-directs the Hartman Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative, which teaches emerging young Muslim American leaders about Judaism, Jewish identity, and Israel. Over 100 Muslim leaders have participated in this unique program. Yossi's 2013 book, Like Dreamers, won the Jewish Book Council's Everett Book of the Year Award. His latest book, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, which is amazing, is a New York Times bestseller. He also writes for leading op-ed pages in North America, including the, N uh, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and he's also a former contributing editor to the New Republic. He is frequently quoted on Israeli, Middle East, and Jewish affairs and leading media around the world, and we're excited to have him today. Hi, Yossi. Uh, hi, Ari. Good to be with you all. Next, we have Khaled Abu Tame. Khaled is an Arab Muslim citizen of Israel and an award-winning journalist who has been covering Palestinian affairs for nearly three decades. Uh -huh. He studied at Hebrew University and began his career as a reporter by working for a PLO-affiliated newspaper in Jerusalem. After working as a senior producer for NBC in the Middle East, Khaled currently writes for the Jerusalem Post, covering events in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. His work, his work has also appeared in numerous newspapers around the world, including the Wall Street Journal, US News and World Report, and the Sunday Times of London. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Uh, finally, our moderator today is Dumasani Washington, who is the Regional Field Coordinator and Diversity Outreach Coordinator, uh, coordinator for over uh, 10 million members of the Christian United for Israel. He is also the founder and board president of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. Dumasani is a professional musician, graduate of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, and author whose latest book is the second edition of Zionism in the Black Church, Why Standing with Israel Will Be the Defining Issue for Christians of Color in the 21st Century. Uh, we're happy to have you all here today, and with that, I turn it over to you, Dimasani. Thank you, Ari, and thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you, of course, to our uh, amazing panelists, both Yossi and Khaled. Um, I'm honored to be here with you on today, and so we're going to begin the discussion. I'm going to just ask gentlemen, both of you all, a question, or sometimes maybe for one or the other, and let you guys kind of talk and share your knowledge and your wisdom, and then uh, hopefully later on, We'll get into some Q&A, right? So um, uh, I want to start it this way, gentlemen, uh, Khaled and Yossi, and either one of you, we'll start with Yossi first, just to, and then we'll flip it around. Uh, just in general, let's start this way. Tell us what Israel as a state means to you personally. And then this is a very general question, but Yossi obviously is an Israeli Jew, Khaled as an as, as, uh, Arab Israeli. Um, tell us in your own words, just in a general sense, where it is that you live, what is your homeland, your, where you live, means to you? Well, first of all, good evening, everyone. Good evening from Jerusalem. And uh, Dumasani, wonderful to be with you. And Khaled, always a pleasure. I live in Jerusalem uh, at, the very, at the very edge of Jerusalem, literally the last row of houses and you know to answer the question of what Israel means to me in in a way it's like asking me what my mother and father mean to me what my children mean to me uh, and I mean that actually literally because my mother and father are buried in Jerusalem and my children were born in Jerusalem uh, I grew up as you can hear from my accent I grew up in New York uh, but I feel that that was almost an accident uh, of, uh, of circumstance. Uh, there was a great um, Israeli novelist, um, uh, Agnon, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1966. And Agnon uh, began his, his laureate, his Nobel laureate speech by saying, I was born in Jerusalem. Now, he wasn't actually born in Jerusalem. He was born in Poland. But what he was really saying was spiritually, historically, 
Uh, it's a, it was just an accident that I wasn't born in Jerusalem. And that accident has now been corrected. Uh, you know, I, I grew up uh, knowing that I would live in Israel. And, and for a very simple reason, uh, I, I had this overwhelming sense that Jews for thousands of years had longed to come here and couldn't. They were in exile. And my generation was privileged to be born with the reality of a, of a Jewish majority state. Uh, and I knew that this was the, the great adventure of Jewish history, and I had to be part of it. Thank you, Yossi. Khaled, how about you, sir? What's the question? What does Israel mean for me? Yes, sir. As an Arab Israeli, you live there. Wow. You've lived there all your life, obviously. In a general sense, we'll get into some more specific uh, topics for both of you gentlemen, but let's start off with that one, Khaled. Yeah, well, you know, uh, people normally or usually ask me, how do you feel as a non-Jew uh, living in Israel? I mean, do you really feel that you belong to Israel? Do you feel that Israel is your state? Uh, and my answer is very simple. I'm an Arab Muslim, a citizen of Israel, and I have no problem with that. And to be more honest with you, I mean, and I'm not afraid to say it, I even dared to say it uh, at some very unpleasant places like university campuses in the US, I'm a proud Israeli citizen. I'm not ashamed to say that I'm an Israeli citizen. Uh, I was born here, I was raised here, I went to Hebrew University, I live, you know, the Israeli life, I breathe uh, Israel. For me, Israel is my state. I feel that, you know, uh, I belong to the state, I'm part of it, and I want to continue living here. I don't see myself uh, living elsewhere uh, or in any other place. You know, there was uh, recently some talk about Israel handing some parts of uh, uh, Israel or some Arab communities in Israel to the Palestinian Authority. And many Israeli Arabs, many Arab citizens of Israel were very upset. They said, hey, what's going on here? You know, we want to be part of Israel. We want to continue living in Israel. Now, does that mean that we're not facing problems uh, as a minority inside Israel? Yes. We have problems, uh, you know. Uh, uh, is Israel an apartheid state? No, we're not talking about apartheid. We're talking about uh, problems that any minority uh, in any country uh, could face. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, problems of uh, unemployment, poverty, uh, inequality, and things like that. But uh, as a citizen of Israel. Uh, I'm not against Israel. I want to continue living in Israel because I believe in the Israeli system. I want to fight for my rights inside Israel. Uh, I don't want to be an enemy of Israel. Uh, as such, you know, uh, I see myself as a proud Israeli citizen, as an Arab living in Israel with many problems uh, facing us, but I want to solve these problems. I want to work with Israel to solve them. Our dilemma as Arabs living inside Israel is that our people, the Palestinians, living in the West Bank, in Gaza, and elsewhere, are in conflict with our state, Israel. And we are sort of caught in the middle, we the Arab Israelis. But we know what we want. As I said, we want to continue living inside Israel. We would like to see a good life for our people there in the West Bank, in Gaza, you know. We want a solution. We want peace between our state, Israel, and our people, the Palestinians living there. But we, the Arab Israelis, have made a choice. We want to stay inside Israel. Why? Because number one, it's our home, and there is no reason why I should go and live uh, in Ramallah or Gaza if I don't want to. And secondly, because I still feel much more comfortable inside Israel today than I do in Ramallah or Gaza. And we'll talk about the reasons uh, for that later. 
thank you, Jamal. And yes, yeah, so for those who are, are listening, there are some terms that, uh, and we're just kind of assuming that those of you who are on may not be aware of some of them. And we're going to drill down, give these gentlemen who have immense knowledge and experience uh, an opportunity to kind of go further. Uh, Khaled had mentioned apartheid, which refers to South Africa. Yossi mentioned, he didn't mention the word Aliyah, but he talked about moving from where he was in New York and become uh, coming an Israeli citizen. And we'll hopefully touch on those as well. We only, uh, we obviously, young men, we could, if we could cram a lot in within this time that we have, we'll do as much as we possibly can. But one more general question for now, Khaled, we'll start with you this time. You all have both shared what it means for you personally. In general, again, a very general question, what do you feel or how do you understand Israel is perceived outside of Israel, non-Israeli citizens, whether it's in the West or in the East, how do you generally feel that Israel is seen or the, even the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Uh, well, that question was for me, right? Yes, sir, we'll start with you, Khaled, and then to Yosef, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, look, I can tell you, you know, I, I'm a reporter, I'm a journalist, and I've been working as a journalist for uh, over three decades right now, uh, working with the international media, helping the international media cover the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I can tell you that uh, I believe that we, the journalists covering this conflict, have actually committed a big crime against Israel. We are responsible for the fact that many people around the world today think or believe that Israel is a racist, murderous, apartheid uh, country, that uh, we are responsible for the fact that many people think, uh, you know, many non-Jews and non-Arabs think that Israel is a country that wakes up every morning and all it thinks of is how to inflict pain and suffering on the Palestinians. Now, why is that happening? Because we in the media, as I said, we've committed a big crime against Israel. Our bias against Israel is responsible for this. We have turned Israel into a monster in the eyes of many people. Okay, Israel makes mistakes. I'm not saying that Israel should not be criticized. I'm not saying that there's no wrongdoing on the Israeli side. What I'm saying is that in the media, in the foreign media, we are obsessed with Israel. Our obsession with Israel drives us to focus only on what Israel does. And by highlighting negative things about Israel all the time, you create this impression in the world that Israel or the Israelis are the bad guys and the Palestinians are the good guys. And I, I alluded to this uh, before, uh, you know, I went on, I, I was invited to speak at, at a number of uh, university campuses around the world and especially in the US and I was surprised by the hostility towards Israel that I met at these campuses from students, from uh, professors, and from all, all kinds of uh, uh, pro-Palestinian groups. Uh, I, I even uh, met people who were more extreme than Hamas and the Islamic Jihad in their views towards Israel. Mm -hmm. And I also met people who uh, were misinformed or, or did not really know much about this conflict. And when I asked many of these people, how do you know that what you are saying about Israel is true? The answer I got from most of them was, this is what the media reports. This is what we watched on TV. This is what we read in the newspaper. And that's why I said before that we in the media are promoting this. Uh, anti-Israel uh, image. Uh, we are, you know, I, I, I would even go further than that and say that we are also promoting anti-Semitism by constantly and daily focusing on Israel. Uh, we wake up every morning, we the reporters, and all we do is just search for any story that reflects negatively on Israel. So, 
as I said, we should, you know, put things in proportion, keep things in proportion. Is when Israel makes a mistake, it's okay to criticize Israel, but what about the mistakes on the other side? Is there no wrongdoing on the Palestinian side? Is there no repression by Hamas, the Islamic movement in Gaza, or by the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank? These are questions that need to be asked. Thank you, Khaled. Yossi, for you, sir, same question. How do you feel it is perceived, Israel is perceived, or the conflict is perceived outside of Israel? Well, I, um, I agree with, with you, Khaled, and, and uh, I've had similar experiences of working in media um, and, and on campuses. But when I, when I try to step back for a moment, uh, it, it seems to me that, that a certain amount of mythologizing toward Israel is inevitable. And I think there are several reasons why. This is a very big story. It's, it's a larger than life story. First of all, there's no example like this in history of a people that lost its land 2,000 years ago and kept faith with its lost land, never forfeited its claim, uh, which is an amazing story in itself, maintaining a kind of a, uh, I call it a vicarious indigenousness over 2,000 years. And then even more amazing, showing up 2,000 years later and actually uh, fulfilling its dream of, of return. So this really is a, a it's not a rational story. It's it's this is this is a this is a very this is a very strange and big story. And so it's easy to to mythologize about the story. And then if you factor in uh, where this is taking place, it's taking place on a strip of land that's revered by three monotheistic faiths. Uh, three faiths that uh, over the centuries have not always gotten along. And so and so the Jewish people returns to this deeply contested strip of land, which is inherently mythologized. The land itself is mythologized. And, um, and then, then if you factor in the circumstances of, uh, of Israel's conflict uh, with the Arab world, uh, with the Palestinians, but also more broadly the Arab world for 70 years or more, Really, even in the years before state this hundred year conflict. And for people who don't know the conflict or don't follow it carefully, and truthfully, there's no reason why outsiders should be following this conflict carefully. Uh, I didn't follow the conflict in, uh, in Kosovo carefully. I had some vague idea about what's happening uh, in Kosovo. And, and, on, and on the basis of that, you draw your, your, your conclusions. And so if you don't really know the details, if you don't know, for example, that Israel uh, consistently, almost from the beginning of this conflict, said yes to a two-state solution, and the Arab world said no, and the Palestinian leadership said no, and went to war repeatedly. If you take the conflict out of its context, what you see is, a, here's a country claiming to be a democracy and occupying another people for 50 plus years. Uh, that looks bad. And, and it's very easy to, to apply all kinds of, of, uh, of stigmas drawn from other conflicts onto this one and say, well, that's what this is like. Uh, look, you know, I think that, that Israel is a very complicated place uh, in the sense that, on the one hand, we are the only democracy in the world that's also a long-term occupier of another people. And again, there's, there's a context, there's a, there's a reason for that, but still, that is a fact. And also, Israel is the only country in the world that lives with the possibility of a permanent death threat uh, that has been taken out against it by many of its neighbors by Iran, by Hezbollah, by Hamas. We hear on a daily basis, your days are numbered, we're going to destroy you. Uh, and we've, we've heard variations of that for a hundred years. 
and so deeply embedded in Israeli consciousness is this awareness of vulnerability, not victimhood. I draw a distinction between victimhood and vulnerability. Israelis are not victims. We're powerful. We can protect ourselves, but we are vulnerable. We're the only, we're the only minority state in the Middle East. We are the only non-Arab, non-Muslim state in the Middle East for thousands of kilometers around. And so that, that creates a certain sense of vulnerability. So on the one hand, Israel is the occupier. On the other hand, Israel is vulnerable. Israel is living under a death sentence. And these are the two, for me as an Israeli, these are the two realities that struggle within me. The, 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 the need to end the occupation, and I feel that urgently. And on the other hand, the fear that I have that ending the occupation uh, and, and shrinking Israel back to very vulnerable borders, eight miles wide uh, at the narrowest pre-67 point, uh, will only make us even more vulnerable in one of the most dangerous regions on the planet. So these are the struggles that I have, but it's very easy if you're not paying close attention to the conflict to draw these sweeping mythic uh, conclusions, uh, which is really what Khaled is talking about. You also, you touched on a couple of different things. Well, more than a couple, but I'm, gonna, I'm trying to do this as, as, as uh, swiftly as I can. And I'm going to turn and pivot to Khaled. But first, Yossi, I'd like you, for the listeners, you use the term occupation. Tell them what you mean by that. Obviously, when we hear that term in a, in a context that is attacking Israel, it is usually a very colonialist, imperialist sort of, you know, came to old land. So explain how you mean that. And then Khaled, my question to you is related. Yossi also mentioned, uh, just so you'll know where I'm coming, he mentioned the the uh, the attempts at peace, right? Israel's attempts at peace with the Palestinian leaders and how that has failed historically. Khaled, I'd like you to talk about that for a moment. But Yossi, let's start with you. Tell them what you mean when you say occupation. Well, look, for the last 50 plus years, since the 1967 Six Day War, uh, Israel has been in possession of the West Bank. And there are two and a half million Palestinians, Khalid, living in the West Bank today, about two and a half million. Yeah. Probably uh, a bit less. Sorry? Probably a bit less. Okay, two million. Mm -hmm. And these are people who don't have Israeli citizenship. Now, my hope is, and this is something that I've, I've believed for, for many years, is that we are holding the West Bank uh, almost uh, as, a, um, as, a, as a down payment for a future peace. And I believe very strongly in the land for peace arrangement. And so I don't want Israel to extend Israeli law to the West Bank and offer citizenship to the Palestinians, because that means that there won't be a two-state solution. The only chance that I feel for, for a long-term uh, normal life or semblance of a normal life for our two peoples is, is a two-state solution. I feel that, that uh, incorporating 2 million Palestinians into Israeli society is a recipe for turning Israel into, into another Yugoslavia or Syria or Iraq. I believe it will be a disaster. And, uh, and I'm also very, very aware of the dangers of a Palestinian state. When I look at Gaza as a, um, as a possible model for what a Palestinian state would look like on the West Bank. And where I'm sitting right now, where I'm speaking to you all now, I am literally on the border between Jerusalem and the West Bank. I'm, my porch is, is on the border. I'm looking out now onto the lights of two Palestinian villages on the next hill. And the West Bank is right here. It's, it's, not, it's not hundreds of miles away. And so the consequences of creating a Palestinian state that could then be taken over by Hamas 
and then threaten my neighborhood with rocket attacks, the way that Hamas attack attacks uh, Israeli areas, towns, villages on the Gaza border. This is something that I, I, I live with acutely. Nevertheless, I believe that it is in Israel's urgent long-term interest to come to terms with the Palestinians, to come to terms with the counterclaim of the Palestinians. There are two peoples that share this land. This land, I believe, needs to be ultimately divided between our two peoples. Uh, not because I want to cut up this land. It's small. It's, it's, it's painful, almost to the point of being unbearable to think of cutting up parts of this land. And the other thing I'll, I'll tell you quite honestly is I, I, I don't feel myself to be an occupier of, that, of the West Bank. For me, the West Bank is, the, is Judea and Samaria. It's the biblical Judea and Samaria. But I recognize that there's another people there. And that, and that people has a counterclaim that I have to come to terms with. But it's not that I am a colonialist in, in, in that land. For me, that's the land of Israel. Just as Palestinians believe that what is now the state of Israel is the land of Palestine. And so my vision of, a, of an eventual peace agreement is that the land of Palestine cannot be the same as the state of Palestine. The state of Palestine will be smaller, it will be in the West Bank. And the land of Israel cannot be the same as the state of Israel. The problem is that the land of Israel and the land of Palestine are the same place. And so we're going to need to, each side will need to contract and accommodate the counterclaim of the other. That's my goal, that's my vision for this. Thank you, Yossi. Khaled, I don't know if you want to touch on any of those. I know I had mentioned to you about the actual um, peace uh, uh, deals that uh, Yossi had mentioned. So either one of those, Khaled, whether you want to mention or touch on the issue of occupation and or the issue of uh, land for peace or the peace deals in the past. Look, I mean, before we talk about the issue of occupation, <clears throat> I think what Yossi failed to mention was that the Palestinians today have two governments, one in the West Bank and one in Gaza. And each one of them has constituted people living there. And these people have Palestinian citizenship. The Palestinians in the West Bank who are living under the rule of the Palestinian Authority, they don't want to become Israeli citizens. They are already Palestinian citizens. And I think that's good news for Israel, by the way, that the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza do not want to become Israeli citizens. Uh, if I were a Jew living in Tel Aviv and I woke up one morning and I heard millions of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza saying, we want to become Israeli citizens, I'd be very worried. Why? That would mean the end of Israel as a Jewish state. So Palestinians are actually saying, we want to be separated from Israel, which is good news, by the way. Uh, they are saying, we do not want to be part of Israel. And that's also good news. Now, where is the problem? The problem is that Israel is facing two Palestinian camps that are each demanding from Israel 100%. Now, one camp, it's led by the radicals, the extremists, uh, the Islamists. They're saying, we want 100% of the land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. We want all of the land of Israel, where Israel is sitting, including the West Bank and Gaza. In other words, they're saying Israel has no right to exist. We want to replace Israel with an Islamic state. So here's one camp that is basically saying, I can't make peace with Israel because I don't believe in Israel's right to exist in this part of the world. The land, all of it, belongs to Muslims 
and we want to establish an Islamic state. And if there are some Jews who would like to live as a minority in this Islamic state, they are welcome. So that's one camp that wants 100% of all the land. Now there's another camp. Uh, in the West, it's called the moderate camp. I call them the less radical camp. Uh, it's a PLO camp or the Palestinian Authority camp, if you want, or the folks sitting in the West Bank in Gaza, the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank in Gaza. They are also demanding from Israel 100%. Of what? They're telling Israel, Israel, give me 100% of the West Bank, of Gaza, and East Jerusalem. I want to have a Palestinian state on this land next to Israel. And I cannot make even a 1% or 2% concession to Israel. It has to be 100%. Now, here's the problem. Israel is not going to comply with the demands of the first camp that is demanding the elimination of Israel. I don't see Israel dismantling Israel and putting Jews on airplanes and ships and sending them out of here. So that's not going to happen. With regards to the second camp that wants 100% of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, there is a problem. Number one, Israel cannot give 100% of that land, of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Israel can probably, and there have been offers, Israel can probably give 90%, 92%, 94%, I don't know, but there have been Israeli offers. By the way, Israel in 2005 withdrew from Gaza. Israel pulled out from Gaza. There, there are no Israeli soldiers in Gaza. There are no Jewish settlers living in Gaza. So that part has been solved. Gaza is now under exclusive Palestinian control. They have, it has a government run by Hamas. Uh, it has, there are two million Palestinians over there. Uh, so that's been solved. Now, the problem is with the West Bank in Gaza. I said before, because of the reality on the ground, which is very complicated. I mean, Yossi from his uh, porch can see the lights in the, uh, across the street in, in the Arab neighborhoods. I mean, people have no idea how small this land is. Uh, this, the situation on the ground is so complicated that Israel cannot and will not give 100% of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. But Israel has been offering 92%, 93%. Where's the problem here? Why have all these offers been rejected? All these peace deals, we call them. They've been rejected for one major reason. None of them was 100%. Listen very carefully to what Palestinian leaders are saying. They're saying, I want 100% of what Israel took in 1967, namely the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. 100%. Yasser Arafat said that uh, at Camp David in the year 2000. And that's why the Camp David summit organized by President uh, Bill Clinton failed. And then Mahmoud Abbas, since then, his successor, President Abbas, has you know, been very clear. I give them credit, by the way, for being very honest and consistent about their messages. They're saying, if you don't give me 100%, there is no deal. And that's why it's very difficult for Palestinian leaders to return to the negotiating table with Israel. I'm, when I say Palestinian leaders, I'm referring to the Palestinian Authority and the PLO. And by the way, I can understand them when they say, we don't, we don't want to go back to the negotiating table. Why? Because if you're already saying 
Israel must give me 100% or there is no deal, then why bother and go and negotiate? There's nothing to negotiate if that's your position. Now, why are we in this situation where Palestinian leaders cannot make a 1% or 2% concession to Israel? Palestinian leaders can only blame themselves for that. Why? They keep telling their people, we will never make any peace agreement with Israel unless Israel gives us 100%. Or they keep sending messages to their people that anyone who makes concessions to Israel is a traitor. So if you are telling your people that concessions to Israel is an act of treason, how can you come back to your people with 98% or 97%? Your people will shoot you. And that's why we are revolving in a vicious cycle. How do you break that? Through education. You know, I'm not saying that Palestinians need to become Zionists. And I'm not saying that Palestinians need to become pro-Israel and endorse, you know, uh, all the teachings of Jabotinsky and Herzl and the Zionist movement. What I'm saying is you need to prepare your people for peace with Israel. You need to prepare your people for the possibility of concessions and compromise. But if you are inciting your people against Israel on a daily basis, and you are radicalizing your people against Israel, you will never be able to make peace with Israel. You demonize Israel to a point where you tie your own hands. So education is very important. Now, I'm sorry to tell you that I don't see that happening. I see the exact opposite. And when I say education, I'm not only referring to what's being taught in the schools. Education is what your parents tell you. Education is what you see in your neighborhood. Is you, education is what the imam tells you in the mosque. Education is what your leaders tell you in their public statements. Education is what the media broadcasts to you. So we are talking right now about a cultural problem. And we need brave Palestinian leadership to stand up and say, folks, maybe it's time for a new direction. Maybe it's time for us to lower the volume lower the volume in the sense that we should stop delegitimizing Israel and start preparing the people for the possibility of peace with Israel, for accepting Israel in this part of the world. That is the only way to move forward right now. I was going to turn and pivot. Thank you, Khaled, about... Um... Uh, this the apartheid claim. We have a couple of questions, and I, I know uh, the panelists would like to take them. I see one live here uh, in the chat, and I'm going to just ask. Uh, I'll start with Yossi, I guess, and then we can go to Khaled. I'm reading it here in the chat. It says, "Why are we talking about leadership if this conversation is ultimately a product of Jews in the U.S. wanting dialogue? The current leadership of Israel is problematic in his support for authoritarians around the world." What about the lives of everyday Palestinians who live under Israeli military presence? Um, so Yossi, I'll start with you with that question, sir. And Khaled, no, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan of uh, this Israeli government. We have elections next week, and I am fervently praying and doing whatever I can uh, as, a, as a public figure to uh, make my, uh, my opinions known. Uh, I find, uh, for all kinds of reasons, I find this government deeply problematic. I would say this is uh, the first government, in terms of um, the Palestinian issue, this is the first government 
uh, that we've had uh, in decades, really since the 90s, uh, that, um, that wasn't uh, a peace-minded government, that wasn't really offering the Palestinians a serious uh, two-state deal. I don't believe it here, I agree with, with Khaled, I don't believe that even if we had a very left-wing government in power, it would make a substantial difference because I, I don't believe that the Palestinian leadership is prepared to really live uh, in, in peace and to compromise with Israel. But still, I want to see my government taking the initiative and trying at least. And the reason is for, in part, for what uh, this question uh, raises, which is I, I'm very mindful of the fact that on the next hill across the way, there's a roadblock. And I hear the people honking, lining up uh, at five in the morning when I'm up that early, I hear, I hear the people already lining up, waiting for their work permits to come into Israel. Now, life uh, in for Palestinians uh, is, 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 is difficult, sometimes very difficult. Uh, some, of it, some of it is a natural consequence of the security uh, issues of the conflict, but I believe that we need to be doing whatever we can to reach out, to try to find a different way, even if it is impossible right now, and it is impossible now. But look what's happening in the Middle East more broadly. Salad, I'd love to hear your take on that, because what, what's happened in the last year is that Israel now has peace agreements uh, with four Arab countries in addition to Jordan and, and Egypt. And these are the first genuine peace agreements that we've ever had. Jordan and Egypt are very formal uh, peace treaties. Uh, the agreements that we have with the Emirates, with Morocco, they, these are people to people agreements. And that can create the basis for a transformed Middle East. And, and my hope is that the Palestinians will, be, will become part of a wider peace process. They can't be left out of, uh, of the new Middle East. There's, not, there's no way to build a bypass road around the Palestinians. I just hope this problem is going to go away. Thank you, Yossi. There's several questions, and we're going to get to them, obviously, as quickly as we can. This is another one. Khaled, I'm going to have you uh, touch on this one. There was another one from the same person, I believe it says, um, and I want to look at this specifically. It was a specific example of what had happened here just recently about a shooting. It says, um, what about the excesses of the military police, such as the shooting of the special need kid in Jerusalem? I believe he means at the Shuk. Um, it says on there, why are border guards shooting suspects in the off time? Oh, hey, Khaled, that's for you, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know which incident you're referring to. Mm -hmm. They are referring to. Um, I believe I know, but I'm not. Go ahead, Yossi. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Yossi. You can clear it up for us because I'm, I might be thinking about something else. Go, yes, sir. Uh, there was a um, there was an incident where a young man who was autistic, uh, mm. a, a young Palestinian man, yeah. whom uh, who border police mistakenly uh, feared was coming at them. And they, they mistook him for a terrorist. They told him to stop, and he didn't understand. And they shot and killed him. Uh, and so uh, that's, that was really a, 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 just a heartbreaking incident. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not routine. It's not something that happens every day. And, uh, and I think that that's important to say. On the other hand, when these abuses happen, we have to own up to them. We have to investigate them. We have to realize that the situation that we're in, it almost lends itself to these kinds of, of call them mistakes, call them abuses, and it's, it's a combination. Thank you, Yossi. Um, Khaled, I don't know if you wanted to touch on it. I have another one for you, but go ahead, sir. You know, I, I'm aware of this issue now, of, of this incident. Of course, it's a tragic incident. And I'm not here to judge, you know, anyone, uh, because the, the security situation is very complicated on the ground. Uh, this is what happens when you have uh, young soldiers 
uh, roaming the streets of Jerusalem. And they're being told to be very careful and to be on alert. And uh, when they see that some other uh, colleagues have been stabbed or uh, shot at, you know, or killed. Uh, uh, so, you know, the, the, the incidents like this happen. They shouldn't happen, of course, but uh, we can't just stop there and say, oh, here's one incident and that's all. Uh, because th there are so many things happening on the ground that don't make anyone happy. I mean, uh, they're very tragic, they're very sad. Uh, I've been covering this conflict for many, many years. And, uh, I've seen many people uh, fall victim, Jews, Arabs. I don't distinguish between a Jew uh, or an Arab when it comes to uh, being victimized. Uh, for me, they're all uh, human beings. Uh, that, you know, we, we share the same place and uh, we share the same pain. Um, a mother's pain is also, you know, it doesn't really make a difference whether she's Jewish or Arab. So I would not just, you know, stop at one incident, say this is an example. Look, the, I, I can assure you, I mean, I live in Jerusalem. I live not far from where that incident happened. The Israeli policemen do not wake up in the morning and say, what do we do today? Uh, let's go and shoot a Palestinian. You know, they're standing there, a Palestinian passes by, he happens to be autistic. Uh, they, they called him to stop, he didn't stop, he ran away, they thought he was a terrorist. Uh, and you know, one thing leads to another. Uh, things like that happen, they're tragic, they happen all over the world, by the way, but I was also uh, at the home of this boy, and who did I see there? I saw a lot of Jews, Jewish officials, Israeli government officials, even the mayor, come to uh, offer their condolences to the family, which is a, a very good sign. Mm -hmm. So as I said, you know, we want to break this uh, cycle of violence. This is what happens when you have fear on both sides. The boy who ran away was afraid of the policeman, and the policemen were afraid also. So uh, things like that happen, unfortunately, of course. Yes, sir. Khaled, and you'll see, I'll start with you, Khaled, this time. Um, I'm gonna try to combine a couple of different things. One of these questions here is, what do Palestinians inside Israel and in the West Bank think of the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, and sanction? And Khaled, while we're doing that, let's see if we can fold this into it. We know that that comes from the entire apartheid area. Of course, those who are on, online here, if you know about the apartheid area in South Africa, this uh, white dominated government that had suppressed the black majority. Uh, there was a worldwide movement to boycott South Africa and bring awareness to what was going on. That has been applied to Israel as an apartheid state, hence the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement. Khaled, what do fa Palestinians feel about that movement there in the West Bank? Look, I can tell you from my personal experience, the first time I heard this uh, term, you know, BDS, boycott, divestment, sanction, was when I visited uh, Canada, probably 10 years ago. And there I met people who, you know, described themselves as BDS activists. And when I asked them, what does that mean? They said, oh, we want to boycott Israel, divest Israel, san impose sanctions on Israel. And I said, so, and then, how does that help? They said, well, it will create pressure on Israel. And uh, I told them, look, I mean, can you explain to me what measures you're planning? I mean, what, what, what is the action? And they said, oh, we want people not to work in Israel. We want people not to do any business with Israel. We want people not to buy things from Israel. And I told them, excuse me. I mean, this goes against the interests of the Palestinians living there. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of Palestinians uh, who rely on Israel every day, uh, you know, for work, for uh, business, for, uh, that's number one. And number two, doesn't this call for boycott, doesn't this go against the uh, perception, the, the idea of peace? I mean, doesn't peace mean cooperation, uh, coexistence, doing business together and things like that. And I honestly discovered, like many Palestinians here, by the way, that this whole BDS idea was more about hating Israel than helping the Palestinians. I didn't feel that these people really care about the Palestinians as much as they 
uh, hate Israel. It's only focused on, it's like Israel, 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 Israel. Okay, but that doesn't help me. Mm. I want to see cooperation. Uh, as a result of these calls for boycott, uh, some Palestinians have lost their jobs. Some Palestinians working in Israeli factories in the West Bank uh, have lost their jobs. Uh, but, unfor but fortunately for us, on the other hand, and ironically also, many Palestinians here do not listen to the BDS. They continue to work in Israel. They're at, uh, at present, uh, there are more than 30,000 Palestinians working in Jewish settlements in the West Bank. And there are tens of thousands of Palestinians who have permits to go and work inside Israel every day and come back. So the BDS you know, idea is not working over here. It's more you know, relevant at the campuses, at all these forums where they call for boycotts and uh, where they are waging all these anti-Israel campaigns. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> uh, just to show you how much Palestinians are not really aware of it, uh, a few years ago, I took some foreign journalists to a village in the West Bank. And uh, during the interview, they asked the Palestinians, what do you think about the BDS? And 99% of the people we talked to them did not know what BDS was. Uh, we got, you know, different uh, and funny questions from people saying, you know, what does that mean? Is that some kind of a... Uh, a, a new movement? Is that some kind of a, uh, a weapon? Uh, is it what kind of an organization? You know, people, I mean, one guy thought it was actually a, a type of food. Uh, but people here are not really aware of it. And that's good. I mean, uh, I, don't, I personally don't believe in boycott. I believe in cooperation. I believe in reaching out. I believe in uh, uh, having, you know, a normalization. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what peace is about, but boycotts don't really help. I didn't see Israel collapse, or uh, I didn't see the Israeli economy really suffer as a result of, uh, of uh, these measures. If you want to help the Palestinians, you know, uh, come here and uh, teach Palestinian children English, for example. Come here and expose Palestinian children to democratic Western values you are talking about. Uh, come here and uh, promote democracy and good government. Come here and demand an end to dictatorship under the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. That's helping the Palestinians. But mm -hmm. sitting at a university campus in the US or in Europe and calling for boycotts of Israel and attacking Israel day and night, that doesn't really help the Palestinians over there, over here. So this is my view, and this is the view of, of most Palestinians, by the way, over here. Yossi, somewhat related, but I want you to, if you don't mind, sir, uh, touch on this. We obviously know the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, as Khaled was saying, it's used often just in a demonizing way, obviously. But Yossi, could you please, when it comes to anti-Zionism, uh, which is sometimes that's part of it. In other words, this against Israel, not so much a criticizing Israel, but just against Israel. And that being what many people are calling the new anti-Semitism. What are your thoughts on that? Um, and how do you feel that that should be addressed when it comes to the issue beyond criticizing Israel, but just being against the Jewish state? Well, you know, Israel has built into its foundational identity is that it is a Jewish state and it is a democratic state. Those are the two pillars, according to the Declaration of Independence, which is our formative document. Uh, and the Declaration of Independence actually has legal status. It, you, you can refer to it to the, at the Supreme Court. It's part of the fabric of uh, of how, of how we understand ourselves. And to, to tamper with either one of those identities, either Israel as, as a refuge for the Jewish people, as the homeland for Jews around the world, whether or not they actually move to Israel, it's their spiritual homeland, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, Israel is the state of all of its citizens. Israel is a democratic state, whether or not 
whether or not you're Jewish. So it has these two very complicated identities. It is the state of all Jews, whether or not they are citizens. And it is the state of all of its citizens, whether or not they are Jews. And what anti-Zionism does is, is do violence to this entwinement of these two identities. Now, to my mind, creating a state of refuge for the Jewish people uh, is, is, there's, it is one of the great um, correctives uh, of injustice in this community. That's how I see it. Provided that Israel remains a democratic state. Israel cannot only be the state for Jews, it also has to be the state for its citizens. And as long as Israel is struggling to maintain those two identities, then to, to dismiss Israel as, as anti-democratic, as illegitimate, uh, to my mind, is, uh, is, is, again, is, is doing violence to, mm -hmm. to the most basic identity of Israel. Yes. But there's something that I think is going on. And that is that Israel is the only country in the world that is always on trial. And if, if, if something goes wrong in Israel, then you, you imme one immediately hears cries questioning Israel's right to exist. And we're the only country in the world whose existence is conditional. And that I find unacceptable. And even if everything that Israel's enemies say about Israel is true, and so much of it is, is not true, so, some of it, so much of it is half-truths or outright, outright lies, or extracted from its context. But let's assume all of it was true. That still wouldn't deny Israel the right to exist. Mm. Uh, look, at, look at what's happening around the world. Look at, look at Syria, look at North Korea, look at the evil that's erupting in one country after another. And yet when you look at what's happening at the UN, the UN devotes more resolutions condemning Israel, not only more than any other country, but more than all other countries combined. And for me, that is already, that, that has a very bad smell. That, 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 that evokes a, 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 a certain time in our history when the Jew, the Jew was seen as evil. And now what's taking the place of the Jew is the Jewish state. The Jewish state is the ultimate evil. The Jewish state is colonialist, <clears throat> is racist, is apartheid, uh, is an ethnic cleanser. Uh, all of the evils of the world are represented by the Jewish state, not coincidentally fitting a pattern throughout history where the Jew always embodied whatever a given civilization defines as its most loathsome quality. Now we're seeing that same pattern happening toward the Jews. Gentlemen, uh, the, everyone's intrigued. Uh, I've been let know by uh, the, the, the powers that be that we have about another 10 minutes. If I can indulge you just 10 more minutes, we're a little bit over time, but I know we'd all like much more. So let me just try to delve in some more. Khaled, there's another question that's on here and it says, what is it, to be, what is it like to be someone from the LGBTQ community living in the West Bank and or Gaza? It's very difficult. Mm. Uh, it could also be very dangerous. Uh, members of this uh, community have been uh, attacked many times by uh, Palestinians, whether they're in the West Bank or in Gaza. Uh, several of them have been killed uh, because, you know, Palestinian society is a very conservative society. Uh, in Gaza, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, dominated by uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's Hamas movement. 
the Palestinian Authority, which is supposed to be less uh, uh, or more tolerant and uh, more secular and less radical than Hamas, has also been uh, uh, persecuting members of the uh, of this community in the West Bank. Just recently, I think I reported about it. Uh, a few months ago, the Palestinian Authority banned a meeting of this community uh, that was supposed to take place in, uh, in one of the Palestinian cities. And they warned them that you know, uh, the meeting would be, uh, uh, or, the, or participants would be arrested. Uh, they said that uh, what these people are doing goes against the values and uh, the uh, teachings of Islam, and we're, this is the Palestinian Authority. That's why many of these uh, people have, uh, in recent years, fled to Israel. They have an office. Uh, th there is a group called El Kautz, which is uh, representing the uh, LTG, LTBG, right, community, uh, the Palestinian community, but their offices are in Israel. Uh, they cannot have, have offices in Ramallah or Gaza because it's uh, too dangerous over there. So it's, uh, it's not easy. They had a report recently that showed that uh, they're being persecuted, tortured, beaten up, arrested, detained by Palestinian uh, authorities, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. So it's not very difficult. It's not very easy to be a member of this community in such a, uh, in such a very conservative, uh, traditional society. Thank you, Khaled. Um, Yossi, you had touched on, and I believe Khaled did as well, you referenced the United Nations at one point. Um, obviously, we talked about the entire apartheid claim, which came out of uh, the 2001 Durban conference, of course. Um, Yossi, just as, as, as you can, where it comes to the United Nations, whether it's United Nations Human Rights Council, United Nations Relief Works Agency for the Palestinian Refugees. Tell everyone why you feel those agencies are, and they are, but we'll do as quickly as we can, why they are so focused. You mentioned that. They're overwhelmingly focused on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and past resolutions condemning Israel. Why do you feel that is? Well, it's interesting because um, the, the animus toward Israel really began uh, at the UN uh, through an alliance between the Soviet bloc and the Islamic bloc. Um, and, uh, and this goes back to the 1960s and 1970s. And uh, for a while, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, it's, which was really driving the, um, the notion of Zionism as racism, it really uh, the, the, the main force UN that was, that was targeting it. For a while, there was a hope here that the situation would improve. But what ended up happening was that the UN created a, a, a whole system uh, of, uh, of support for the Palestinians, some of, some of which uh, was humanitarian, uh, much of it was purely political. And, uh, and this, this is in some ways a holdover of, uh, of, of what I consider really to be a Soviet Union's war against, against Israel. And, and so, for example, the only permanent refugee issue that the UN deals with as a permanent body built into the UN uh, is the Palestinian refugees. And this is a refugee situation from 70 years ago. Look at what's happened just in this last decade in Syria alone. There are millions of refugees from just that one conflict and millions of others from throughout, throughout the world. There are, there are something like 60 or 70 million refugees. But the UN ignores most or downplays most of those refugees. Crisis and remains focused on, on the Palestinian refugee crisis, which is actually self perpetuating because it is also the only refugee identity that's inherited from generation to generation. You pass this identity down. And I think that that's deeply unhealthy 
for the Palestinian people. It keeps the Palestinian people in a permanent um, sense of, 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 um, of powerlessness. And it's one of the reasons I believe that Palestinian leaders uh, haven't shown up to the negotiating table uh, with the intent of really solving this problem. There's mm -hmm. too much invested in that, in that identity as refugee. And in order to, to solve this problem, in order to create a two-state solution, we're going to need Palestinian leaders who don't see themselves only as victims, but see themselves also as, as, as capable of self-empowerment. And uh, there's something else, and I might have heard this from you, Hannah, that the amount of, of foreign aid that has poured into the Palestinian Authority over the years is proportionally greater than the foreign aid given to any country anywhere in the developing world. No country, no block of countries has gotten the kind of aid that the Palestinian Authority has received. What did they do with it? it it's, it's been frittered away. Uh, you don't see it resulting in hospitals and schools. It's, it's the infrastructure there is not being substantially improved. It's after billions of dollars of foreign aid. So there's something in this system that the UN has perpetuated of keeping Palestinian refugees permanently in this state of of, of suppression, of refugee status. Again, that's inherited from one generation to the other, that I think ultimately is working against the Palestinian people, against a two-state solution, uh, and against peace. I'm going to end it here, gentlemen, with one last thing for you, Khaled, so you can finish it for us again, sir. Um, the Abraham Accords uh, is a historic uh, thing, obviously, in which Israel is uh, either making peace or, uh, or having uh, open dialogue with uh, nations formerly not so, which Morocco, Sudan. Uh, Khaled, give us, if you can, your perspective on what that means, what that even portends going forward. Well, first of all, I mean, these are great accords. These are great agreements. Uh, any peace agreement is great. Uh, but what makes these agreements really uh, good and positive is that for the first time, we feel that these agreements are about peace between people on both sides and not a peace agreement signed between governments. You know, we have two peace treaties between Israel and Jordan and Egypt. But these peace treaties, or this peace has been very, very cold. Uh, we never felt, or we did it at least with Egypt in the beginning, but for the past three decades, we didn't really feel that this peace was between the people. Ironically, in Jordan and Egypt, the anti-Israel movements are very strong. The calls for boycotting Israel in these two countries are very powerful. In these two countries, you have the so-called anti-normalization movements that would punish any lawyer or journalist or physician who meets with an Israeli or visits Israelis. Now, why are the agreements between, or the Abraham Accords, the agreements between Israel and the countries you mentioned different? Because for the first time we see interaction between the two people, we see enthusiasm on both sides. We see the two sides talking about future projects, about economic cooperation. We see people in the Gulf states going on social media and other platforms to talk about their eagerness, their desire for peace. This is something we don't have with Egypt and Jordan. I mean, when was the last time you saw a Jordanian or an Egyptian go on TV and uh, talk about 
peace with Israel. So I'm actually in the, you know, regarding these agreements, I'm very uh, optimistic. But on the other hand, we need to be very careful. Uh, if, making if anyone thinks that making peace between Israel and these Arab countries will solve the Palestinian issue or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that's not going to happen. Uh, first of all, because the Palestinians have rejected these agreements. They've attacked these Arab countries, accusing them of betraying the Palestinians, of uh, stabbing the Palestinians in the, in the back. Uh, they've accused the leaders of these Arab countries of being traitors. Now, that's not very good. And that's why the Palestinians have lost the, uh, a lot of sympathy and support in the Arab world. Uh, Secondly, I don't see any Palestinian leader who can stand up right now and say one good word about the peace agreements between Israel and the Arab countries. So the Palestinians for now are not part of this. Uh, also, I don't see any of these Arab countries having any influence with the Palestinians. How can these Arab countries have leverage with the Palestinians when the Palestinian leaders are attacking these Arab countries for making peace with Israel. So mm -hmm. another point I think which is very important to note is that one of the reasons why it it's much easier to make peace between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and other countries is that, first of all, they don't have a large Palestinian population living there, like Jordan, for example. And secondly, these countries not we're not engaged in direct wars with Israel, unlike Jordan, Egypt, uh, uh, Syria. They, you know, they're, they're seen as being far. They're not really part of this. Uh, uh, they were not directly involved in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that's why it was much easier. I mean, what's the dispute between Israel and Qatar over? They don't even share a border. What's the dispute between Israel and the United Arab Emirates? They actually have a lot in common, technology, high tech, uh, prosperity, and things like that, when you think about it. So, and that's why you know, I'm optimistic, because I, I hope that in the end, we will have brave Palestinian leadership that will wake up one morning and decide to start working for the interest of the Palestinians. And, not only you know, uh, promoting hatred against Israel and uh, promoting anti-Israel conspiracies and all that, that doesn't help. We need a new mindset. We need a new narrative. We need new leaders, brave leaders, who will stand up and say, I'm going to solve this whole issue. Folks, we are not going to get from Israel 100% but let's take whatever we can right now and let's build a better future for our children. Mm. Powerful. All right, gentlemen. So uh, give a rapid answer to this one if you can, and then we'll wrap it up. Please recommend for the people one book, one movie or article that you feel that they should read, see. All right, just think about that real quick, that they should, maybe your own, right? Obviously, but give them a title of something that they need to watch. My per, my personal favorite is Fauda in terms of television, but that's a different thing. Let them know which one you feel they should watch or read, sir. You'll see, start with you. Uh, this is a really unfair question to ask a writer, <laughs> especially a writer who deals with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So um, rather than, than mention my book, I will uh, tell you all to uh, follow Khaled in the Jerusalem Post <laughs> Thank because you. uh, you'll really get a, uh, a terrific uh, view uh, into Palestinian society by a courageous journalist who, who, who tells it, really tells it as it is. Yes, sir. We'll Thank recommend you. your book too, Yossi, but go ahead, Khaled, you too, sir. <laughs> First of all, thank you, Yossi. I, you know, I've known Yossi for probably 30 years now. We were uh, colleagues uh, at one point uh, at a magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, not because he's with us, but I really admire his work. I've appeared with him on many panels, and I really recommend his book, the last mm -hmm. one, Letters to My Palestinian uh, Neighbor. That's, a, that's the name, right? I actually have it here, not far from me. 
and uh, I gave it to my son to read also. Uh, but I also, I always advise people, I mean, okay, uh, you don't really have to rely only on me, but when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, try not to rely on one or two sources. Try if, to enrich yourself with as many sources, expose yourself to as many sources as possible. Try to understand the different narratives, the, the contradictory uh, uh, narratives uh, that, that are out there. Uh, put yourself in the place of the Palestinians and put yourself in the place of the Israelis and try to understand both sides. This conflict is not a conflict between good guys and bad guys. This is a conflict between good guys and good guys. The majority of the Arabs living here are good people and the majority of the Jews living here are also good people. But it's a conflict. We're both caught in this conflict. On the Palestinian side, the biggest problem is bad leadership. Leadership that never offers its people any hope. Leadership that keeps dragging its people from one disaster to another. Leadership that constantly radicalizes its people. Leadership that is corrupt. Leadership that does not really care about Jews or about Palestinians. And that's why I go back to my point, we need good Palestinian leadership. So try to read as much as you can. I strongly advise you to go to different sources. There are hundreds of places on the internet you can learn about this conflict, uh, including, of course, uh, what we write, you know, in the Jerusalem Post and elsewhere. And if anyone has any questions, you're always welcome to contact me directly and ask any questions. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. And when the pandemic is over, I'll also be back with the, my friend Yossi uh, on panels and speaking to uh, groups here and there. Love it. Dumasani, what's one book you recommend? For movie? Well, I'm the same as book plug that Yossi didn't do because I'm not Yossi. I just finished a book called Zionism and the Black Church. And it's from a Black American and African perspective about the conflict and how it has impacted the Black community. So Zionism and the Black Church, um, it's, uh, you can Google it. It's not on Amazon at the moment. It will be in the next couple of days, but it's on our website. Uh, and I can put that in the chat as well. Amazing. Honestly, this was a fantastic conversation. And I think everyone watching, I know they learned a tremendous amount. Uh, personally, I wish more of these conversations got more visibility with people from all backgrounds talking about solutions, talking about coexistence. And unfortunately, as we see, especially on social media, you have the extremes trying to shut down these conversations um, and trying to re you know, repress voices like the people on this Zoom call. Um, but I, I agree, definitely read Yossi's books. They're amazing. Khaled is a must follow on Twitter and Dumasani's book I look forward to reading. Um, hopefully he's going to send me a copy. Um, <laughs> but we have there right now. Amazing. Um, but we have some great, progr uh, great programs planned for the future. So we hope everyone stays in touch as we'll be emailing out um, some future events. Thank you again, Yossi, Khaled, Dumasani. We really love this conversation. We appreciate it. Stay safe. All right. Thanks Thank you. Very well.